Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Greg Waynes, and uh, this talk is uh, basically to share Starling X team's experiences in evaluating using OS3 to do parallel atomic software upgrades on our Starling X cloud servers. So the abstract, um, to paraphrase, um, OS3 is basically an upgrade system for Linux-based operating systems or Linux-based deployments. I believe it's typically been more used in embedded operating systems. But uh, in SDX8 of Starling X, we introduced uh, OS3 and we're using it for patches in SDX8. And now we're starting to evaluate it for uh, full software release upgrades of Starling X. So in, in these slides, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not an OS3 expert, but I'm gonna give an overview of uh, OS3, what it is, how it works, uh, how, you, how upgrades are done with OS3. And then I'm gonna take a look at how we're, we're proposing and looking at it to use it in Starling X. And then what's the impact, the, the positive impact on upgrades, uh, the elapsed time and outage times for upgrades in Starling X. Okay, so myself, Greg Waynes, I'm a principal architect at Wind River for the Wind River Cloud Platform. That's the commercial version of Starling X that Wind River has. Uh, I've got 25 years of kind of platform experience kind of dating back to kind of Nortel days. Uh, so mostly telecom space. I'm a founding member of Starling X. Five years ago, I was kind of here in 2018 when we announced Starling X. And, and I've worked in various areas of Starling X, some security, some open stack, high availability, software management stuff now, even, even docs. Um, last couple of years, I've been on the technical steering committee for Starling X. Uh, that's been fun. And then previous to Starling X, I've done very, very minor contributions into Mazakari and Horizon. Um, so yeah, so the agenda, I'm basically gonna give a brief overview of Starling X, very brief, a single slider, and then like I said, uh, introduce OS3 and then talk about how we're actually gonna use it in uh, Starling X upgrades. So Starling X, I'm sure you've heard a lot about this in, this week. Um, so uh, as you probably know, Starling X is an open source project in the Open Infrastructure Foundation. It basically provides a complete, ready to deploy fully integrated private cloud infrastructure management. And uh, it, as far as infrastructure management, it you know, manages bare metal servers, the OS resources, device configs, manages all the infrastructure software that's running on the servers, so the biggest of which is Kubernetes, manages containerized application services that we have in Starling X. Most of them are uh, other open source projects or services that we've really just packaged and uh, reintegrated into the Starling X. As far as deployments, Starling X has a wide range of deployments. It can be deployed as a standalone cloud and, and really on a single server standalone cloud. And then it can be multiple nodes in a standalone cloud, you know, the classic, you know, controller nodes, worker nodes, storage nodes. But by far our most popular deployment option is distributed cloud where you've got geographically distributed subclouds, um, and those in the telco space, those subclouds are typically single server clouds, um, and those are autonomous clouds. And like I say, they can be single server, they can be multiple, multiple nodes, but they're autonomous clouds on their own just for reliability. And then the central cloud in the distributed cloud environment is really there for automation and orchestration of managing the infrastructure across all the, uh, the uh, remote subclouds. So that's Starling X, OS3. So as I mentioned, OS3 is an upgrade system for kind of Linux-based deployments. Um, it basically does two things. It manages versions of bootable Linux file systems, so rootfs, in a very Git-like fashion. And then the other thing it does is it manages bootloader configurations and defines kind of a file system layout in Linux such that the Linux system will boot and run a rootfs that is effectively a checkout of a rootfs commit from an OS3 repo. So with those two things kind of with OS3, you can manage software and manage software upgrades such that the bulk of the steps actually happen while you're still providing service and still running the active rootfs, basically. And so resulting in 
in primarily the outage time uh, being reduced uh, for an upgrade on the server. When you first look at OS Tree, you kind of think it's a package manager. It's not a package manager and actually kind of in embedded systems, it's basically used instead of a package manager. Um, but it, there's been developments where you, there's really hybrid approaches to using uh, OS Tree with a package manager. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, like I said, the first thing that OS Tree does is does, uh, you know, version management of rootfs just like a git. So I thought the easiest way to show you that was just show you some commands and you'll quickly realize, oh, it's like git. So you can just see the, there's an OS Tree init command initially that uh, initially creates an OS Tree repo and I just dumped out the subdirectories under there. It looks very much like a git repo. Um, if I wanted to create a first commit for my OS tree repo, I could, you know, make a temporary root FS. I populate, populate it with a, a root FS for a Linux uh, deployment, such as Starling X. And then I basically commit it into OS tree. And so I'm doing a commit there with uh, specifying a branch, SCX9. If the branch doesn't exist, it'll create it. And then I'm putting a subject tag on it saying it's a GA release SCX9 and specifying the, the rootfs content that I just, just created. So that'll create the, the commit in OS tree. I can do an OS tree refs to list out the branches. You can see there's an SCX9 branch now. And then I can do an OS tree log to list the commits and the commit is there, the GA commit. And then I can obviously remove the temporary rootfs because I've checked it into to OS tree and just like Git, I can check it out if I if I need it again. Uh, you can see I, the rootfs is back. I can make a change. I can fix a bug, um, and then I can commit the whole rootfs back into the OS tree. And you notice that just in this example, I'm going to commit it back into the same branch, SDX9. I'm going to tag it as okay, it's patch one for SDX9, and then you can see that you know I just still have the same one release branch, but now I've got basically two commits in my uh, my OS tree branch, just SDX9 GA and the, and the patch. And then also, like Git, you can actually specify in a local OS tree, you can actually specify remote OS trees, the repos that you can pull from. So in my little example here, I said, oh, I've got an SDX build server, so I'll create a remote uh, create a remote for this OS tree, I'll call it my SDX build server, specify the URL, specify the branch that I wanna, wanna pull from. And then once I can do that, then on my local OS tree uh, repo, I can pull that, it'll pull all the commits in that branch down into my local OS tree repo. And then now you can see that uh, when I do the OS, OS tree refs for the branches, I've got SCX9 that I just locally created. And then now I've got a, a remote, uh, uh, a remote branch from my SDX build, SDX10, and then I can list the I list the commits there, and then I got a SDX10 GA commit. So you get the idea. Idea. It's exactly like Git. Okay. So that was the easy part. The hard part. Uh, so like I say, there's an OS tree deployment layer that's defined that effectively defines a file system layout so an, uh, a Linux deployment can basically boot and run from effectively an OS tree checkout of a, of a root FS. So I'll go through the key concepts there. So first key concept is that the, you know, most OS tree based Linux deployments have a sysroot partition. And in that sysroot partition under kind of sysroot OS tree repo is my local OS tree repo. So that's the main OS tree repo for this OS tree based Linux deployment. And it's got basically got one or more commits in it, basically all the releases that I've kind of loaded onto this system at one time or another. And then under sysroot OS tree deploy, basically I have one or more deployments, which are actually basically checkouts of a particular commit in OS tree. And though those commits, one of them is the one of them is the actively running root FS and other ones could be ones that I'm in the process of upgrading on. And yeah, I forgot to mention that just when you do OS tree checkouts, it's very similar to Git in the sense that it uses hard links to uh, 
you know, to uh, conserve disk space. Okay, the next, okay, so the next thing is there's three top level directories in Linux that you need to understand in order to understand how OS tree manages the software. There's slash user, slash etc, and slash var. So slash user, slash user in an OS tree based system contains the entire rootfs. So it's exactly what, the, what you committed in OS tree as your rootfs. It has uh, uh, all the software that's being managed by rootfs uh, by OS tree. And OS tree completely manages it. And you can see that it's actually read only, the, the, the actual slash user top level directory is actually read only bind mounted to the checked out uh, rootfs commit in that uh, under the deploy directory. So actually, kind of side benefit of, of uh, OS tree is that uh, it, uh, the software managed by OS tree is, is, is immutable in the sense that um, y even, even a user with root permissions couldn't accidentally change the software. All the, sof the software is all changed through uh, OS tree uh, operations. And then obviously, in a normal Linux deployment, all the managed rootfs software is not under slash user. There's other top level directories like slash bin and slash lib that have managed rootfs software. Those all end up being symbolic links to the analogous directories under, under slash user. Slash etc. So slash etc is partially managed by OS tree. So slash etc contains configuration of the services in the OS that are being managed whose software is being managed in slash user. So obviously it's configuration data that the user you know, will configure for a particular deployment. Um, so, uh, so, so OS tree can only partially manage that. It's got to preserve the user configuration. So what OS tree does is that when it's actually doing a deployment from one rootfs uh, commit to another rootfs commit, it will actually do kind of a funky three-way merge of the old default etc config in the rootfs that I'm migrating from, the active systems etc that's got the user's configuration in it, and the new default configuration of the rootfs that I'm upgrading to, basically. And then finally, slash var. So flash var is in an OS tree based system. It's basically used for storing all the runtime persistent data for the OS and for all the platform applications in your Linux deployment. Like in the case of Starling X, it would be uh, uh, the Starling X infrastructure applications. So this is not managed by OS tree at all. So OS tree does not touch this at all. And, and again, obviously all the runtime persistent data in a typical Linux deployment isn't necessarily under slash var. It, again, there can be root level directories with persistent data. And again, it's just symbolic links to under slash var. Oh, and then finally, finally, uh, there's the slash boot partition. So this is like a typical slash boot partition for Linux. Um, it basically has the bootloader configuration to indicate what kernel to run. And in the case of an OS tree system, it also refers to what deployment under sysroot OS tree deploy that I'm actually wanting to boot into the next time my system boots up. And so when an OS tree deploy happens to do an upgrade, it actually knows how to update the boot configuration uh, in order to get it set up so it will boot into the right rootfs. Okay, so how does a vanilla OS tree upgrade actually work? So I've just started out with an initial condition here where I'm running an OS tree based Linux deployment. I've got one commit, say commit 05 uh, in under my sysroot OS tree deploy and uh, um, and so that's the starting point. So first thing I do is I do an OS tree pull to pull down the, the, my new software release. So I'm doing an OS tree pull from a remote external OS tree repo that pulls down into my local, local OS tree repo. Obviously there's no impact to the rootfs that I'm, the, the, the rootfs that I'm running at the time and the services I'm supporting. And then the next step is a multi-step step. step uh, it's basically doing the OS tree deploy. So what happens at this point is that a, deploy, a new deployment directory happen, gets created under deploy. It, we ba it basically 
uh, OS tree checkout is done to check out the new rootfs commit, which is the new release of software. A into that commit, it does the uh, OS tree will do the three-way merge to manage the etc directory, and then OS tree deploy will also update the bootloader configuration to indicate that the next time you reboot, uh, you will boot into that uh, deployment under uh, under sysroot OS tree deploy. So again, all that can be done without uh, uh, impacting rootfs. And then finally, you reboot the server to reboot it back, it, reboot it into the new rootfs. Uh, you know, the, the updated boot configuration will run the updated kernel, and the, you know, the updates to the bootloader configuration scripts will actually change the rewrite mount, or the bind mounts in order to point to the right rootfs that you want to come up in. So that's a, that's a general idea, and it's the last thing on OS Tree is, I mentioned it's not a package manager, it's uh, really typically used instead of a package manager. I think you know, in a classic package manager, like R, with RPM packages or dev packages, those deliver partial file system trees that contain the software for a particular software. It's got metadata, it's got install scripts, and take it, Typically, the package manager takes those packages and installs them directly on the running rootfs. So in the case of OS Tree, as you've seen, OS Tree deals with complete bootable file systems, the complete rootfs. So it has no idea about how the rootfs got built or anything. It just knows how to save them in its OS Tree repo and it knows how to deploy them, basically. So. Um, uh, so I mentioned that there is a hybrid approach now. There's a number of tools that use it. RPM OS Tree is a good example of a, a hybrid tool that can be used on the server that you're managing the software. And it's basically a combination of the two. Software still gets delivered as packages, but then you use OS Tree to actually deploy it. But what that means is that the hybrid package manager has to effectively you know, check out the current version of rootfs on the target you know, it's got to install the packages in a shrewd environment, and then it's got to commit the updated rootfs back into OS tree so that it's basically got the staged new rootfs ready for an OS tree deploy. But uh, so why would I do kind of hybrid? It's basically you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the, the package delivery, which certainly in the case of patching, you get small, kind of much more readable software updates. In an air gap scenario, I, you know, I don't have to do OS tree pulls. I can deliver uh, through files. And, and I can also deliver different package sets to different deployment sites if, if that's a requirement. So I can do all that with the flexibility of the packaging delivery, uh, but then I can still leverage OS tree to kind of be able to build and stage my rootfs in, in parallel with running my, uh, my active rootf, rootfs system. Um, uh, as well as do the atomic upgrade on uh, reboot. So, um, so how does this translate into Starling X? So the proposal that we're looking at is that we're going to use a hybrid uh, package manager. Um, the diagram that I show here shows a multi-node Starling X cluster. Obviously, each of the nodes will have a local sysroot OS tree repo. That'll be the main OS tree repo that it uh, boots from. But then we're also going to have a central remote OS tree repo on the controllers. So it'll be in that repo that our hybrid package manager will basically stage and install the packages into a root, a root FS and store the commit back in OS tree to basically stage the, the, the new release upgrade in that remote, uh, in, in that uh, central OS tree repo. And then when Starling X software upgrade orchestration kicks off, it, you know, to do basically its rolling upgrade of uh, the different nodes in the, in the cluster, basically when, whenever it gets to a certain point for a particular node to say install the software, instead of wiping the disk and using package manager to install to the root partition, it's going to just do an OS tree pull from the the central OS tree repo to, to bring in the new software in a rootfs commit, and then do an OS tree and deploy and reboot like we saw before. So how does this help Starling X software upgrades? And what I wanted to show was, what I wanted to show in the slide was basically 
the major steps of a Starling X software upgrade. And specifically, this is for a single server Starling X uh, uh, deployment, um, just because that's the one where the impact is the greatest because I can't do a rolling upgrade on a single server. So, um, uh, so basically what I've got here is the major steps for uh, an upgrade of a single server. I've got some time estimates here on the, uh, for each of the steps, just to kind of get a ballpark view of uh, what, the, uh, what the times and what the improvements might be. Um, so to just walk through this, so you, um, you, you start, when you start an upgrade on a single server system, we actually have to back up the, plat the Starling X platform system data that's on the root partition, because I'm, today I'm going to wipe out the root partition. This is like today's model without OS tree. Then I administratively lock the host to get it into an upgrade mode. I wipe the disk. I wipe the root FS because I'm going to install the new load on it. I obviously don't wipe the partition that has a backup that I just did, and I don't wipe the SEP disk because it's holding the persistent data of my guest applications. Um, and then I basically run the installer ISO for my new release of upgrade to basically do the package installations uh, on the wiped root, root partition, and then I re reboot into the M plus one software. But then I basically got a a new N plus one installation, which I really have to bootstrap using the backup data that I have to basically restore the system data associated with the Starling X deployment. So I have to do that, and then more than likely you have to do some migration of uh, Starling X data due to data model changes, and then you finally unlock the host and upversion the containerized system apps. So there's a lot of steps in our current upgrade and most of them are actually in the outage window when I've basically disabled my uh, uh, hosted guest services. So how does it change in with uh, OS tree? So two things changed. One is there's less steps. I don't have to back up data because I'm not going to wipe the root partition. I don't, and then I obviously, and then I, because I don't back up the data and I don't wipe, I don't have to do the bootstrap and restore the system data from uh, from the backup. So those steps are gone, and then other steps basically move outside of the outage window. For example, the whole installation of packages actually happens even potentially outside of the maintenance window, because I can my hybrid package manager is basically going to create the rootfs in a shrewd environment, install the packages in that shrewd environment. Um, so that can all happen well before even the maintenance window. Um, and then e I can even migrate the data in that shrewd environment such that that's done outside of the uh, outage window as well. So kind of with a combination of reduced steps overall and some of the steps moving out of the outage window, you can see that kind of the elapsed time and outage times could be significantly improved with uh, the, the OS tree solution. So just as a summary, um, kind of talked about, gave a brief overview of the OS tree as an upgrade system for Linux uh, deployments, and just talked about how basically it manages uh, versions of rootfs just like Git. Um, and more importantly, it has this deployment layer with a file system layout so that you can you know, boot and run effectively checked out versions of the, the rootfs and in that allows you to basically do uh, a lot of the staging of the, the, the upgrade and upgraded rootfs in parallel with continuing to run your uh, active rootfs uh, and then the atomic upgrade to switch over to it. And I also talked about just the fact that uh, OS tree can be used as a hybrid package manager and that's the proposal that we're looking at for Starling X. Um, and, and then finally just kind of walk through the you know, the, the impact, positive impact of uh, the, uh, the elapsed time and outage times for upgrades just because of reducing the steps, not having to wipe the disk, and actually moving some of the steps outside of the outage window, especially in that single server scenario. And, and I didn't mention before, but, well, I mentioned at the beginning that, like I say, the, in a lot of the telco kind of 5G deployments that we have, 
a lot of those uh, remote subclouds are single server solutions just because the uh, you know that's got enough horsepower to run kind of the the remote uh, 5g apps and that's really it i just wanted to say that if this sounds like something cool that you'd want to work on, you can get in touch with the Starting X community either through our mailing list or you can check our website for when our community meetings are. You can come to the main community meeting and then uh, if you're interested in looking at that, we can kind of connect you into the different sub projects within uh, Starling X uh, uh, in, in order to kind of collaborate with whoever uh, is, is working on this. And that's it. I don't know if there's any questions. Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. I suspect it just fails, and the three-way merge, uh, the the three-way merge that happens is not when you, you haven't committed to doing that deploy yet. So I suspect it just fails, and you, uh, yeah, have to kind of figure out what happened and uh, likely, uh, likely uh, you know, uh, supply a new commit in order to do it. Just like, a, yeah, like, like I say it's Git-like, but it doesn't have all the Git capabilities, so. You just get an error on that merge and gonna have to fix it manually. Yeah, there are some, we haven't got into details of that, but yeah, there are some cleanup requirements in two areas. The, under the SysRoot OS tree deploy, there's cleanup that's required under the different deployments that you have there. And then there's also cleanup of the OS tree repo itself. OS tree does support pruning of uh, the tree. Uh, and, uh, and definitely, yeah, after, in, in a lot of product deployments, you would, you know, have frequent patches and you would, you know, you would get a lot of uh, cleanup, you know, a lot of disk space used and cleanup required. So that's definitely something that has to be looked at. Yep. What about uh, fail, uh, fail back uh, in case of some errors during the upgrade? Is it possible to restore the previous version? You can, yeah, I mean, you can effectively do an OS tree deploy to any commit. It doesn't have to be the next commit. So you can really go back to a particular commit. And certainly, I mean, there, there's, there's gonna be details with respect to migration of data. I, I know in the first uh, iteration of, of doing this, we really are supporting going back only in kind of a rollback scenario where we can roll back the data easily to what we were just previously running as far as data migration. And uh, for some things, it's actually better than that. You can just, in your bootloader, select your previous tree, just like you used to select your previous kernel. Mm -hmm. And that works, you know, through command line parameters. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. It would work better if you made sure that you version some of your data, right? If you're doing data changes to yeah. your application. Yeah. 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 yeah, like for the, for the migration that we're doing, I, didn't go into the details here, but yeah, for the migration that we're doing for the Starling X data, we're managing that data in slash var and basically versioning the data in there so that when we do the migration data, we, so we could kind of get that data when we go back. But, but the reason we're only doing it for rollback is because we, can, we still have the data, we can go backwards, uh, backwards and get it, and we know on a rollback, nothing's changed as opposed to if I wait three months and now try to do a downgrade, you know, typically, typically in Starling X, we don't write downgrade data model scripts. I, we've, been, we've been asked to do that, but, uh, but uh, yeah, typically it's only upgrade scripts that we're doing. So that, that's why we're kind of trying to limit the scope to rollback. Um, how do you generate like the first commit, you know, um, the, the base image? 
Yeah, the, the uh, so for the base image, uh, like uh, we'll deliver, like today we'll have an installer ISO that basically has all the dev packages in it. And it'll really be, again, I don't know the specific details about this, but we'll, it'll really be like a de-bootstrap type right. uh, setup of, uh, you know, the initial rootFS and then using Shroot to install all the other packages on top of that. All right. Thank you.